Welcome to Track E, the international track. I'm Carl Gerber, your track producer, and I'm the chief data officer for Deloitte US. The MIT CDO IQ Symposium continues to expand our global reach. We have an excellent lineup of sessions that bring the world view. You are in session 16E, a panel on building trust in personal data sharing across data spaces. It has been a longstanding slogan that data becomes valuable only when used and shared between stakeholders. However, sharing data might also have adverse effects and the interests of different parties may be conflicting. Therefore, ethical and societal challenges related to data sharing practices have become a hot topic for everyone from executives to citizens. The panelists are long-term advocates who have been calling for more ethical approaches to data sharing. They will discuss how different stakeholders, individuals, data holders, and governments are reacting to data sharing around the world and what it will mean for the future of data sharing. More importantly, the panelists will present various approaches that can be used to build trust in data sharing between parties. For example, what it means to move from a customer-centric to human-centric business model, to align digital services with ethical virtues, and to manage decentralized identities between numerous parties. They will also discuss how leading organizations have been approaching these goals and where to look for new ideas and best practice. I want to remind the audience that this session is being recorded and this and all sessions of the symposium together with presentations will be made available to all participants following the symposium. You may submit questions to this session specifically in the Whova Applications Q&A tab. If you see a question that you would like to see addressed, please vote it up using the voting feature. With that, I'm going to introduce Sammy Lane, our, who will moderate our panel. Sammy is information management practitioner and best paper awarded researcher with over 15 years experience in several business sectors. During the years, he has worked widely in projects from strategic management to process improvements, as well as service development and data management consulting. He is currently competence lead in Silly Solutions PLC, president of DEMA Finland, and a longtime advocate for information quality management. Additionally, he has been promoting emerging topics like openness and ethics in information management as a part of activist networks, such as open knowledge and my data movement. Sammy, over to you. Hey, thanks, Carl. Also, from my behalf, welcome to the panel on building trust in personal data sharing. Uh, this inter international track was set up to expand this previously quite USA-centric uh, symposium to new topics, world regions, and industries. Uh, however, MIT CDO IQ participants are already top of the world in their professions. So what kind of topics and perspectives we really could bring here to this audience? Well, traditionally, Symposium has been quite USA-centric. Therefore, we wanted to bring people from Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. Also, MIT CDO IQ Symposium has been quite uh, organization-centric and, uh, uh, and uh, management-centric. Therefore, we wanted to bring also people who are um, who are experts on individual human rights, consumer benefits, uh, public good, and, and have been driving and emphasizing these dif different values. So we have selected here uh, global, global, e globally known experts on these uh, more, more ethical uh, focused perspectives. And the purpose of this panel it was set up to promote these views, how to build trust to digital services. For CDOs, we want to give you some ideas how to transform maybe your current data management practices and your organizations 
towards more ethical services and compliant, uh, legally compliant technologies. The point is to make the digital world a better place for us humans. So uh, I'll try to make room for these world leading experts. Uh, we, in this session, we have actually three world leading experts. Jenny Tennyson is vice president and chief strategy advisor at the Open Data Institute. She gained a PhD in artificial intelligence from the University of Nottingham, then worked as an independent consultant specializing in open data publishing and consumption. She joined the ODI as a technical director in 2012, became CEO in 2016, and vice president uh, last year. The Open Data Institute is a non-profit organization. Its mission is to work with companies and governments to build open, trustworthy data ecosystem. It was actually founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee almost 10 years ago. And uh, uh, to me, Open Data Institute is quite an interesting organization why I wanted uh, Jenny here. And that's because, well, I have been using quite similar argumentation in my consulting practices while promoting this kind of trusted data. So, so to me, Open Data Institute is like seeing my own thoughts presented, but in much better format and systematic ways. So I really would love to hear more what Jenny has to say. And the second person, Antti Poikola, is a data economy specialist, boosting data sharing and human-centric approach to personal data. He is a founding member of the My Data Global nonprofit organization. And he is also a principal author, author of the paper My Data, an introduction to human-centric use of personal data. And to me, My Data Global is actually, and for you, really interesting grassroots type of organization. It grew out of uh, individual activists like Antti himself, uh, founder. It, it started from Open Knowledge Finland and similar networks and turned into a global network of activist associations. And actually, My Data Movement and Antti are were one of the main reasons, if not the main reasons, why we are here and why I got interested in this ethical data movement. So my data movement, it's a really fascinating combination of enthusiastic activists, startup, startups, and alternative thinkers. They think differently, not the money, but how to build a better world. And Nat Sakimura, Third person is a well-known identity and privacy standardization architect and a long-term research fellow at Nomura Research Institute. Currently, he is chairman of the board of the Open ID Foundation and My Data Shape Japan. He is also an author of widely used standards and Open ID Connect. And in practice, he also helps communities to organize themselves to realize their ideas around identity and privacy. He's also active in public policy space. I hope to hear more about this. He has been serving in various committees in Japanese government, including personal data working group. And he has presented, represented Japan in ISO standardization related activities. That's organization OpenID is third interesting nonprofit organization. It has been developing decades these really important capabilities for digital economy, identification and identity management. They are in the core how we share the data and how we may, can keep them uh, trustworthy and useful. So let's. Let's have these three experts to tell more about themselves on their own words. So, Jenny, please. 
Um, thanks very much, Sammy, and it's lovely to be here. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. Um, if you could move to the next slide, thank you. Um, so I'm Jenny Tennyson. I'm Vice President and Chief Strategy Advisor at the Open Data Institute. I'm also co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group within the Global Partnership for AI, and I'm on the board of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Um, uh, Sammy asked us to, to say a little bit about what our personal agenda is around data. And um, uh, since I've been at the ODI, uh, the Open Data Institute for so long and uh, shaped its strategy, I have to say that my personal agenda is really represented in the organization's agenda. Um, and this is the, the, the diagram on the right in this slide is um, a diagrammatic form of our kind of theory of change or theory of the way in which the data ecosystem works. Um, you can see up the middle a very simple value chain of, of data being stewarded, um, things being created out of it, products, services, insights, intelligence, and then people deciding to do things differently because of that information. Um, and that's hopefully leading to a positive impact in the world. So that's how we'd like to see the world working around data, people being able to make decisions, better decisions, more informed decisions, faster decisions on the back of information so that they can act differently in the world to bring about positive impact. But what we see in the world is a, a bunch of activity that, that speaks away from this kind of vision in particular, we see organizations hoarding data, believing it's oil and therefore the best way of getting value out of it is to hold it themselves. Um, and we argue that, that making data more available, more open, sharing it is how we enable others to also get value out of that data. And that doesn't have to detract from the value that you get as an organization. Um, and so we argue for more open data infrastructure, we believe data is a new form of infrastructure, um, better spread of capability and more open innovation around data. We also see worries about, um, uh, worries about data, some of them very well-founded worries about misuse of data, leading to a world where we fear what could happen with data rather than being able to take advantage of it. And the way we think we need to combat that is by having more trust and more trustworthiness in the way in which we handle data. And so we talk about data ethics. Um, so making the right kind of moral choices around what you do with data, um, but also things like equity, who gets the benefit from data and the real importance of engagement and participation in data. Um, and we think that building openness and trustworthiness into our data ecosystems is how we get to that that nice farmland future at the top there, the, the big positive impact in the world. Next slide, please. So just to say a little bit more about what we do at, o, at the Open Data Institute, we have five programs of, of work, which are roughly structured into, into three blocks. Um, the pink block here uh, is really our work with organizations where we're trying to work, improve organizational data practices. We work around data literacy and building a real mix of skills that are needed within organizations, including obviously technical skills, but also the more kind of business oriented skills around you know, how to do innovation around data, what good data governance looks like, um, how a, a strong data strategy can, can lead you forward. Um, we also have a program of work there where we're working with organizations around data assurance, building trust into the data ecosystem so that um, organizations that are taking data from somebody else can trust its quality and, and know how to reuse it. And organizations that are sharing data can trust that those who are reusing it are going to do so in ways that aren't going to impact negatively on, on the organization sharing. We also do work around data ecosystems, the stuff in the green box here, um, working at a real ecosystem level. So with multiple actors bringing together a range of business, public, civil society interests around data towards a particular challenge often. Um, so for example, around net zero or, or uh, around health and well-being um, and building things like standards, innovation challenges in order to get the ecosystem working better. 
And we have a specific interest in data institutions, which are organizations that steward data on behalf of a community, helping to make data flow so that everybody can take best advantage of it. And then finally, we have our fundamental work in our evidence and foresight program, where we're really a, about um, carrying out applied research, looking at what is going to be happening in data policy, in data technologies in the future, and trying to be one step ahead of those to, to help guide us towards that, that positive impact that we want to see. Next slide, please. And the final thing that I just wanted to, to talk about to highlight like one piece of the work that we've been doing at ODI is our data ethics canvas, which is a tool that we developed in order to help organizations or, or project teams work through some of the impacts of um, their data projects. Uh, and uh, this is a, a free tool. You can go and download it and you can, can use it. We recommend using it in, in kind of a collaborative way to really unpack where there are potential positive and negative impacts from the use of data. Things that we, things that you are worried about, things that might go well or might go over well, thinking through aspects of your openness and transparency around your use of data so that we get to this more kind of trusted and trustworthy ways of operating around data and happy to dig into that more if we, as we go along. Multiple organizations are taking this and using this um, as part of their day-to-day -day practice around embedding ethics within their organizations whenever they are developing data tools. And we've worked with international banks, uh, retail organizations, for example, in order to get this into their into their day to day practice. So that's me and the Open Data Institute. Thanks again for having me. Shall I go next? Yes, please. Ante. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. My name is Antti Yogi Poikola. I'm a chair of board from My Data Global. Uh, that's a nonprofit association. And my day job, uh, I work for Technology Industries Finland, um, uh, which represents uh, 1,600 uh, technology companies from Finland. So I, I have one foot in the very much on the industrial world and the other foot. Uh, foot in in the nonprofit world, and on both sides, I uh, heavily, I I would say I am lobbyist. I'm data and digitalization lobbyist. Hopefully, in the positive sense. I don't know if uh, what what kind of uh, feelings you get from the word lobbyist nowadays in, in the world. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, if you go to the next slide, I pre uh, represent shortly my data global. Uh, uh, non-profit. So we stand for a uh, fair, sustainable and prosperous digital society through a human-centric approach to personal data. And what do we mean by the human-centric approach? You can see it in, the, in our logo. There is the uh, human in the middle and all sorts of data sources uh, from uh, education to government to to uh, retail and finance and health and so forth around us. So uh, we look at, uh, of course, the data, the personal data issue mostly. Uh, and typically, uh, the personal data world, uh, there is the strong uh, wave of data protection. So uh, we want to protect individuals so that no harm would be done for them with their data by someone else. So there are requirements for organizations. And my data, we try to see this in a way from progressive angles so that yes, we need data protection, but that's the base. And we need to climb up from that uh, well-protected environment so that people actually could benefit uh, from their data. So one origin of uh, my data thinking comes from the open data world. Uh, Jenny knows this very well. So uh, there, uh, there is and there was a strong movement of opening public sector uh, govern government data uh, uh, so that anybody could use the data. 
and but that cannot be applied to personal data by definition personal data is personal and should not be open for anybody but could it be open for people themselves so i could get my data from these and those companies and and uh, organizations and channel them to some other places where uh, value could be created out of my data so that's the idea that people get value from their data so it's not only being protected you can say that uh, people in prisoners uh, they are protected they have shelter and food and everything but they don't have freedom so we want uh, to have the same idea that we need to have uh, protection and freedom to get uh, benefits from our data data that uh, is, is uh, from us people and at the same time, when we highlight human centric approach, it doesn't mean that it's against organizations or companies. So uh, we believe uh, that for organizations, the ethical use of data is always the most attractive option, or that should be the state of the world. Maybe it's not yet today. Maybe today it's uh, actually very uh, attractive option to be non-ethical user of data, but uh, we believe that in the future it will be other way around. So that's what my data stands for. And um, I will showcase a couple of things if you go for, for so my data was actually uh, recognized in the European data strategy last year, 2020. So my data global is, as, as the name says, global organization. We have hubs in, in uh, 30 uh, uh, cities and countries all over the world and, and not Sakimura is uh, from my data Japan. So this is definitely not a European thing only, uh, but uh, for organization that was only established uh, 2018, it's quite a um, achievement that we were recognized by uh, European Commission uh, with this promise uh, uh, that my data promises significant benefits to individuals, including their health and wellness and better personal finances, etc., by having greater oversight and transparency over their personal data. And that led um, to something that uh, we are very active now. So everybody knows the GDPR, the data protection regulation, but there is actually a big piece of regulation coming out from Europe now, uh, which is data uh, uh, governance act that actually governs those, what uh, Jenny also mentions, the data institutes. So those kinds of middle, uh, entities that um, are operating data between different organizations. So there will be a uh, uh, regulation for, uh, they, they are called uh, data intermediaries. And uh, my data, uh, in order to make this human-centric approach viable, we believe that there should be organizational and technological and legal improvements. And, and this, this is one piece of le legislation that you could put in your notebook. So Data Governance Act, uh, let's see how it uh, turns out in next year, it should be in force. And then going further, uh, one more slide. Um, this is, uh, as My Data Global is a nonprofit organization, we don't actually do stuff in, in, in that sense, uh, like uh, products uh, or so forth. But there are, of course, many companies and organizations uh, who are implementing the ideas of human-centric uh, personal data management so that uh, people could get access to their data and they could decide what to do it and, and channel the data between different organizations. And uh, one case that is uh, fairly new and might be interesting for some of you, uh, S Group is the biggest uh, retail chain in Finland, and I'm one of the members. So uh, there are in Finland, we have only 5 million uh, citizens, uh, uh, but 3 million out of those 5 million have this kind of green card. So we are, it's, it's a loyalty, uh, biggest loyalty card uh, system in Finland. And they started to develop this idea that what about uh, if people could actually get uh, access uh, to very granular level on their purchase data, line by line, everything that you have bought uh, uh, from, from these S group uh, shops and, and uh, how, how your purchase habits develop over time. And this became uh, quite a popular application. It's a mobile app. And then of course you can download the data and so forth. And it just recently in last month, it won a golden lion, um, uh, in Cannes Festival. So those of you who know, it's it's a big uh, marketing um, 
uh, uh, award. So quite uh, quite a good um, showcase of uh, my data ideas put into practice. And it, this is just a screen cap from the developer uh, or the architect from the S group, uh, kind of highlighting that this uh, my data inspired uh, this this uh, application. So this was just one use case, not coming from my data global, but we tried to see and help organizations all over the world to to put these ideas into practice. Thanks. All right. Yes, not please. Yeah, so next to me, I suppose. All right, so I'm Nat Sakimura, um, chairman of Open ID Foundation, and I'm really delighted to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel discussion. Personally, I'm a standardization architect on identity and privacy. So I'm author and editor of Open ID Connect, JOT, FAPI. ISO 29YT4, privacy notice and consent and so on and so forth. And I'm actually pretty sure that most of you actually have or are using the standard that I have written. I've been doing the chairman of the Open ID Foundation since 2011. And I'm actually a co-founder of Kantara Initiative as well. And um, as a part of day job, I'm a member of various governmental uh, committees uh, you know, acting as an expert there as well. Um, the reason why I got interested in data sharing is that uh, back in a um, good part of the 90s, I was purely into the security, but in 1999, my daughter had a failing surgery and um, I wanted to get access to the medical record because um, you know that could have helped her uh, in the new hospital to have a re-surgery but I actually didn't have the access to that we didn't have the right to data access back in 1999 and that was a big motivation for me to start working on you know data sharing and things like that when we think back, ability to get shared and sharing data is fundamental to privacy and the right to seek. Sorry, this is a typo, not seem, seek happiness. Happiness is derived from good relationship with people one is close to. And relationships are maintained through continually exposing various aspects and data about oneself. So to create an, uh, promote uh, protocols that enables safe data sharing became a priority for me. And that's why I started working on something like OpenID. Another topic that uh, interests me a lot during the course of the last 20 years is the information symmetry. Um, individuals and corporations have a great deal of a symmetry when it comes to um, data processing and things like that. That's why I started in conjunction actually with uh, Japanese government, a standard for privacy notice. Now that was turned into ISO IC 29YD for privacy notice and consent. Another topic that I am uh, country very much interested in is the ethical data use. Um, and I'm again working closely with the Japanese government uh, to create a guidance for you know, governance mechanism for data institute as Jenny said uh, to achieve such things. And we are actually in Japan having a certification scheme for something like that going on. Next page, please. So let me just touch upon OpenID Foundation. OpenID Foundation is a non-profit international standardization organization founded in 2007. It's specialized in the standardization of internet identity layer. Now here, ident by identity, we mean set of attributes. 
So if it's about a living human being, it's a personal data, right? Identity layer and API access management. And we have many activities. We've got over 10 working groups and many of them are actually activities on building trust to data sharing. Open ID Connect, often uh, called OIDC, is a selective data sharing mechanism with trust and consumer protection. It's used by over 3 billion users now. FAPI is a high security profile of OIDC and OAuth that's being used as national standards in various countries such as UK, Australia, Brazil, and so on. And OIDC for identity assurance is a mechanism to convey metadata that helps the receiver determine the trustworthiness of the data. It's been used by QTSPs in Italy and to generate qualified certificate and qualified signatures. And there's another a, a protocol called Risk Profile, which is a specification that enables providers to share information about account takeover and other events. Needless to say, if your account's been take, taken over, your privacy is under a great threat and you should be able to act against it. And this kind of protocol helps it. Next page, please. So um, here's a data schematics that we are using when we're developing the protocols. And on the left-hand side, I have uh, laid out three examples of noteworthy um, features of these protocols. So um, at OpenID Foundation, uh, we truly believe that the user should take control. So uh, user control over the, you know, open ID, what we call as open ID provider, it's the entity which uh, safeguards your data and allows you to selectively share your data. And the, and the user should be able to take control of it. And we also believe that there will be many authoritative sources of data. For example, your university degrees are, I mean, your university is uh, authoritative for your university degrees. Um, your company employment record is kept by, authoritatively kept by your employer and so on and so forth. So there will never be a world where there's only one um, data source. Now in OpenID world, we call those data sources claims provider because uh, it's the, you know, each, I, each claims, uh, um, how can I put it? it? It's about, it's claims about the values of that attributes, right? So that's why we call it claims provider here. But I think you can replace it with attribute provider or data provider as well. And for trusted transactions, you obviously need to, you know, open ID provider obviously need to authenticate running party. Running party is the party who uses the data. And running party obviously need to authenticate the open ID provider. So there has to be authentication going on there. And open ID provider then gathers attested attributes from claims provider. And by the instruction of the end user, open ID provider will selectively disclose to the running party. Now, when, we, when I say user takes control, we often talk about consent, but uh, users, the individuals have a notorious uh, tendency to over consent. And um, that's where, you know, information symmetry also kicks in. So we have in our model thought about the feature called assessor and advisor. 
which does assessment of the relying party and advise end user whether you know the data being asked by the relying party is actually legitimate or not. So we have mechanism to achieve this kind of you know data flow scheme. And yeah, all right. So the and you know all those data can be associated with the metadata um, about the which signifies the quality of the data, which is really important to build the trust as well. So um, that's it from me. And I guess we can use this picture during the discussion as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we heard uh, three really interesting uh, descriptions uh, about more ethical ways of doing, doing data management and sharing data and uh, slightly different perspectives, what building trust might mean. But so let's go a little back to reality. What is actually happening around the world? So uh, could you have a little comments how these different stakeholders, individuals, data holders, or public interest, uh, uh, public interest uh, guardians like governments are reacting to this? Are they hoarding, uh, like uh, data holders hoarding the data? Are individuals really trusting data for data holders? Well, what's going on? Would some, someone from you want to start to tell your own perspective? How do you see it? Okay, maybe I can break the ice here. <laughs> so uh, uh, very often uh, when we present my data, the typical question or counter uh, argument is that, okay, but uh, do people actually care? And uh, why would anybody bother being uh, kind of uh, managing their own data? And uh, that's kind of the individual uh, rights aspect. Uh, and then the, my basic uh, response is that no, people don't care and people shouldn't need to care. So we don't really, if, if you are taking your car and driving a highway, you don't care and know uh, the details, how the car works. And if you push the gas or brake, it uh, accelerates and, and uh, slows down the car. So you know very, very high level things about how uh, things work. And that's the same should apply in, in the data world that people shouldn't need to care about the details and micromanage of every data transaction. Uh, but there should be an uh, environment where people can trust that, okay, if I decide that uh, I give my consent or something uh, that my data is used somewhere else, so that it's actually legitimate, uh, so that I don't need to, to go into details of everything and uh, micromanage every transaction. So uh, that's something that uh, the, uh, we should really not think that the individuals are there like the super active participants, actually, that's, um, that's not reality. And therefore, we need regulation and that, that goes to the then public interest and there are lots of battles and I think maybe Europe is, is uh, leading the way in building new types of regulation and that's very contested field uh, and very much lobbied also uh, so I, I just give this one anecdote of uh, GDPR how it came what it is it, it was uh, proposed by the European Commission somewhere back in 2012 and then it went of course to the parliament discussions and so forth and during that process what happened was uh, was the uh, Edward Snowden leaks and that kind of alerted uh, the parliamentarists so it was very much going uh, to to be watered down uh, kind of uh, very much as uh, uh, less uh, rigid uh, version of, of the data protection regulation, uh, but then uh, the parliamentarists saw something interesting coming from the Snowden leaks and they kind of turned it back to the very rigid and that's what, what uh, came the GDPR. 
maybe there are many opinions whether it's good or bad or if it should be more or less and so forth but that's kind of the thing uh, that the mm, politicians when they do decisions about regulations they are basically clueless on any of the details and they they go with the turn tides of uh, what's happening in in the public discussions and and that's why we need to bring these discussions also to to public and politicians that was long answer if perhaps I, I can come in and, and uh, uh, discuss a bit around this. Um, I was at an event yesterday uh, specifically around data in the justice system where one of the things that was really interesting was highlighting the range of different organizations, people um, uh, that, that would have interests in justice data. Obviously, for example, if there is a case, there are the people who are being prosecuted under the case, witnesses, victims, and so forth, multiple individuals often affected. And then you have the court system, the judges, um, you have the, the, the government actors, you have media, you have researchers, all of whom will have some interest in these kinds of data. And this is what we often find, right, in, in, any, um, in any situation where there is, is data, there are multiple potential uses of that data, multiple potential harms from that data, and therefore multiple interests, rights that, that, that organizations, people, and so forth may have around it. And so the big challenge that we see is how we balance those different rights and interests. In this diagram, then public interest is kind of um, shown there as, as being the place for, for balancing some of that, I think. Um, but public interest isn't the same as state interest or government interest. Public interest is much more about bringing together the, a range of different um, people who may be, uh, uh, that, that data is being collected about, but also that are affected by the use of that data. Um, and those groups can be, can be different. And for, for that reason, a lot of the work that, that I've been most interested in um, recently over the, over the last few years has actually been about the mechanisms through which we bring together people to reach decisions about what data should be collected, how should it be used, who should it be shared with, for what purpose, uh, for how long, under what conditions. Those are the kinds of decisions that can only be made in context with particular data, with particular purposes. And so participation around those actually becomes the, the, the crucial factor in making sure that we get to a good position, um, rather than perhaps even things like basic principles around data, around ethical use of data. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd like to bring out from the, from like, uh, this slide about different stakeholders that that we have multiple stakeholders in any uses of data and and how we balance up their different rights and interests in in the collection use and sharing of that data is the real challenge um, and participation methods are the ones that seem most promising in getting us to a good place um, for, for balancing those up yeah i completely agree stakeholder consultation in any data usage, new data usage case is really important. Also, one of the things which I would like to point out is that a lot of um, data holders or the organizations think about their risk management, whereas personal data is concerned. But um, they would, the primary thing that they would have to take care of is actually the risk of the individuals and you know they have to find out how to minimize the impacts there how to protect them and if it's uh, fair or not unfortunate thing is that you know from the the traditional risk management kind of mentality that portion often gets lost so um having a framework like um, privacy impact assessment which involves you know stakeholder consultations and things like that would actually help 
I jump uh, here a little bit. Uh, I think this uh, data being always a uh, concern for multiple stakeholders, that's kind of crucial uh, understanding of data economics 101, but that's uh, not being understood uh, widely. Uh, and uh, one thing, if anything, I would like to uh, <laughs> leave for people here is that stop speaking about data ownership, period. Stop speaking about data ownership. Uh, and that's uh, when, when we use these metaphors of oil or whatever, uh, it's always kind of some tangible, tangible item that somebody owns. Uh, but if you uh, take the example that I showcased, this retail chain thing, the green card. So uh, there is loyalty card uh, scheme. And whenever I go shopping something, I swipe the card and data is being created. Uh, it would be false claim to say uh, that the retail chain owns that data. Of course, well, they have invested in the loyalty card system and they have legitimate interests over that data, but equally I do have legitimate interest over the same data, but it would be equally wrong to say that I own that data because the data is born by uh, the combination of uh, myself and the loyalty card scheme. And there are legitimate interests from both of us, plus probably many other stakeholders. So uh, this um, ownership uh, kind of implies uh, more or less um, uh, like uh, it's exclusive. So somebody owns and it means that the others do not own. And that's uh, very, very tricky or impossible in any data situations, but that's still being uh, debated over and over. Who owns this and that data? Yeah. Well, nobody. Uh, there are different rights for different stakeholders and those needs to be managed. Okay, thanks, Antti. And that's actually a really good comment for this audience because uh, ownership of the data and data governance is one of the big topics for data management and chief data officers. And it's really, uh, it's discussed quite a lot here in the Google platform. And well, I have, I see the same problem from this internal data holder, data manager perspective. The ownership is overloaded and ambiguous term. It's fuzzy, it don't work. There needs to be more granular uh, terminology like authorities and accountability and you need to break it down what ownership needs but let's go to the uh, main topic that because we are here to send a message for chief data officers so how exactly we can build trust in personal data sharing between parties so what are your comments that uh, you might be uh, commenting re regulations be uh, how to make people more trustworthy uh, processes how to build trust or technologies so do you have any comments uh, what you want to tell that what what are the topics and approaches that chief data officers should pay attention when they want to build a more trustworthy data sharing well, quickly, uh, as you put, uh, trust, uh, trusted and trustworthy are two different things. People trust in many, <laughs> many things that they should not trust. Uh, uh, but uh, the question is, is for organizations, uh, why they want to be trusted? Uh, they want to maybe get access to data or hold or do something about it, and they cannot get it if they are not trusted. So. Uh, I, my, I would start building it from the purpose of the usage of data. If the purpose is something that is beneficial for the other party, the other stakeholder, whether it's individual or other company, uh, that's that's the base for creating uh, the, the good transactions. And trust uh, is just uh, uh, something that you need to have there. It's not the end goal in itself. And it's actually very uh, tricky uh, if, if there is trust where there shouldn't be trust, that's a problem, but there is, it's unfortunately also a pro problem for so-called good companies that uh, uh, are not trusted uh, because their neighbor is doing bad things, even if they would be trustworthy. So if I set up a social media platform now, uh, it's probably not trusted, even what, whatever I do and how trustworthy I am. So tricky business here. 
Yeah, the transparency on the data processing is really important. You know, what it, what are you going to do with that data? And you need to be able to justify why it is really needed. And you know, having those transparency uh, communicated to the entire stakeholders, including the public, um, will eventually help. Um, clearing the mist or, or doubt around your practices, I think. If I can add then, uh, we've done quite a lot of work around um, both trust and trustworthiness at, at ODI, including a couple of reports over the over the last year or so, um, specifically around this, this topic. Um, and I suppose to just to bring out some things, um, that there are there are elements that are, are just um, hygiene kind of factors, you know, don't have data breaches is really helpful, right, for, for, for building trust. Um, there are bits around those kinds of demonstrating that you are thinking ethically about the use of data, um, that, that you have the internal kind of um, thought process that you, you think you know what good looks like and you are actually trying to aim towards it. But what we find is even if you do that, then still people don't view you as being necessarily trustworthy with data. Um, and then, then you have to start layering on pieces as I was talking about, about um, uh, where I, I think as Nat has said also, you know, pieces about transparency and also about accountability, about others having a say about the way in which you use data and allowing that to happen, which is a very tricky kind of prospect for organizations to put some of that control back in the hands of um, various kind of stakeholders, but actually can make you seem uh, seem more actually be more trustworthy because you're you're not just doing it for your own interests right you're not just using data for your own interests but I think it is also important to bring out two two other kinds of points one is as Antti said trust is infectious like what you do with data in your data project and the trust around that is going to be affected by the overall perception of the organization that you're working within and the overall sector that you're working within um, so uh, th there is a limit to what the, a, a, a particular bounce towards what's in your remit to be able to control around trust and trustworthiness. We are living in a world now where trust around use of data about individuals is very low. And so you have to adjust your behavior to recognize that fact. And the second thing that I would highlight is that communications is so important. I have come to fight, I've come to believe that proactive, transparent communication, honest communication about use of data is the number one thing that will take you from, from doing the same, from doing something and there being a public backlash to doing something and there being public understanding for what you're doing. So investing in data, in communication about your data practices is, is one thing I'd particularly highlight. Just to say that this um, case from this Finnish retail chain, S Group, uh, they said that this was first ever data or personal data application or use case that they di didn't get any bad press or any, any kind of uh, consumer attacks. So people were just happy. I can see what I purchased from retail chains. So there is the value for people. Okay. okay, this would be a, a good point, uh, Sammy, to pivot to our audience questions. And the first question here is, are there benefits, is, is there a, uh, a need to think about the benefits versus a risk approach when we're thinking about building trust in data sharing? Considering benefits versus risk when thinking about establishing trust in data sharing. It's easy to answer yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, you should uh, balance the benefits and risks. Uh, but I think um, what is being now learned is that uh, data as it is uh, something that can be used by many and it's not worn out. So 
typically the benefits come uh, in the ecosystem level. We can do better business between like five companies if we can share data a little bit. Uh, and the risks are always like taken by somebody. And uh, that's why we need to create this kind of trust mechanism that are on the ecosystem level. So if everybody just uh, takes the balancing of risk and benefits uh, from their own perspective, then probably we are not moving much in the data sharing field. The other thing I'd just quickly add to, to that, which I, which I agree with, is that very often the benefits and the risks are not evenly spread across different populations. And so simply taking an overall benefits and overall risks of approach doesn't actually capture some of the nuance about where those benefits might fall and who gets the benefit from them um, and who is actually feeling the, the risk. Um, so I think it's important to take that nuance when we're, we're looking at both of those. Yeah. It's really important to look at whose benefit and whose risk. Often, the, uh, the mistakes that organizations take is just consider their risk and their benefit. That leads us to the uh, next question, which really builds on, on the first one, and that is, uh, what is your perspective on the economic model for data sharing? You know, data is not free but it also speaks to the motivation for uh, data sharing. And, and so it, it's more of a, what's in it for me across the different stakeholders. So again, what's your perspective on the economics, uh, economic model of data sharing? Matt was unmuted, so I was gonna let him go. Oh, well. I'm super curious to hear the uh, re uh, answer to this uh, simple little question, Jenny and Nat, please tell me. <laughs> Jenny, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see the hot potato has come to me. Um, uh, so th there are, um, I think that we are, that we need to have and have a mixed data, mo uh, data economy model, right? There are some places where selling access to data is like the way in which it can be maintained and etc over time there are other places where um where we would see access to data as being part of the data infrastructure that a government needs to provide in just the same way as we see public spending on roads and electricity and other kinds of infrastructure that we then depend on. So um, I don't think that there's a one answer to what is the right kind of model for financing access to data. I do think there are some tricky ones, in particular, um, individuals getting paid for access to personal data, I think can lead to some very difficult um, societal effects. Um, but but uh, more broadly, I think we need to have a mixed economy and mixed models around it. Um, sorry, the one other thing I'd say is that charging over services to access data is very different to charging for for uh, reuse of data so you can have services that are charged for in order to help subsidize ac more open access to to data in, in, in more bulk or unprocessed ways i would maybe uh continue from that so the infrastructure approach to this uh at the moment, we don't know. This is really the data economy is being developed as we speak, and it's in, in constant uh, uh, phase of uh, experimentation. Um, but for example, these uh, data institutes uh, that uh, Jenny mentions, uh, the data intermediaries, operators, I know that Nat is involved in the same kind of things in Japan, and that's going to happen in Europe and elsewhere. So they create infrastructure which enable different kinds of data economic models. So they basically uh, put the piping so that if somebody uses data somewhere and somebody makes value somewhere and somebody collects the data. So how do we can spread the data and uh, balance the benefits uh, across the ecosystem? Uh, but that doesn't really say yet what is the economic model, but it enables experimentation of different economic models. All right, well, well thank you to our panelists. 
Sammy, in the in the last 30 seconds, over to you for closing thoughts. Okay, thanks. Uh, it has been really interesting discussion and uh, uh, well, I think uh, what the panelists uh, promoted was more this kind of large scale principles like transparency and balancing stuff. Well, we didn't go into details of technologies. They are just tools. We didn't go into the details of laws. They can be changed. So uh, I think uh, this got us into the quite interesting level of fundamentals of ethics, the goals and objectives, what, what really matter, what really matter in our lives and what really are the main core issues when building this kind of human-centric digital world. Thanks. All right. And thank you to our audience. This concludes our session.